One of these images was made by a person who spent years honing their craft. The other five were generated by OpenAI DALI 2 and Google Imogen, state-of-the-art text-to-image AI systems in mere seconds from only a text description. So did you spot the human? The question is, if AI will allow anyone to create images like this, will artists, illustrators and graphic designers soon become obsolete? Part of this video was sponsored by Milanote. I see the notion that artists and designers will be replaced by AI bandied about a lot online these days. I mean, look at the title on this video from TechTuber Marquez Brownlee. In it, he asks his designer Tim to try to create images in Photoshop to compare against ones created by Dali 2. Tim obviously takes a little bit longer to do this than the AI. This inspired me to do my own experiment, which began with a call to a friend in Australia. Hi, my name's Chris. I am a mathematician. I have a PhD in mathematics from Oxford, and now I'm a lecturer at Macquarie University in Sydney. So Chris, I've got a very important question to, to ask you. What is 72,894 multiplied by 6,321.6? I, what? While this human expert failed this basic task, this calculator app gave me the answer instantly. Mathematicians clearly obsolete, or you could say that their days are numbered. Yeah! Dad jokes aside, when people argue that text-to-image AI will replace graphic design, I'm about as baffled as Chris was by my prank call. A mathematician's job isn't to multiply large numbers, it's to solve complex problems. And in the same way, despite the label, graphic designers do more than just create eye-catching graphics. Graphic designers help their clients communicate using applied logic and visual problem solving. Or as Alina Wheeler phrased it, design is intelligence made visible. Much as the calculator transformed the field of mathematics, I believe AI-generated or synthetic images will do the same for the creative industries, though not in the way that people might assume. In this video, I want to take a closer look at the topic from a designer's perspective and explore how AI might disrupt the industry, but also look at where it might help unleash human creativity. And to finish, I'll share three of my personal predictions about the repercussions of this new technology. This video won't be an explainer on text-to-image AI. What I want to talk about is the process the AI uses compared with the workflow of a graphic designer. Both human and AI processes begin with an initial goal. For the AI, it's the prompt, a written description of what you want it to generate. For the human creative, it's the client brief. But from there, the similarities pretty much disappear. In very basic terms, after the AI is given the prompt, it first uses a semantic map called a latent space to build a napkin sketch of what that might look like. This is then sent to the second stage known as diffusion, which squints at the basic sketch and gradually imagines more details while still keeping a semantic fit for the prompt. Each time it does this, you get a random result. That's a very crude analogy, but there are plenty of other videos going into how these systems work, which I've linked down below for those interested. I spoke with AI researcher Han Shao about his open source project Dali Flow and how it uses a slightly different architecture. My name is Han. I'm the founder and CEO of Gina AI. Before founding this company, I was an AI researcher at Tencent AI Lab. So I've been working in the AI industry for, let's say, 10 years. When I play with Dali, you just input a sentence and I can generate a nice image. And that's basically the starting point and also the end point. But to me, if you just give me nine output, that means my creativity, my imagination is limited to those nine output. And as a human, I don't think that's fair. I remember there was a YouTube video about some photographers take 600 photos of a cat. Then he just uh, cherry pick to finally one photo. And I was super impressed by that procedure. Dali Flow basically follows the same idea. The first step is using the Dali model to generate initial candidates. You cherry pick some of them to do the second round of diffusion. It keeps the original structure of the pictures 
but adding more details. Then based on those new round of candidates, you can select one of them and then you can upscale it to the larger size. So that's kind of the human in the loop procedure, which is kind of like a counterpart to the one liner. What human in the loop does is bring human feedback into the system at multiple steps. This more closely resembles the creative workflow for professional designers than the one liner single prompt approach. Graphic designers work on a wide range of projects from book covers to building signage. Branding is kind of like the decathlon of graphic design since you have to think about all kinds of mediums that a company might use from stationery to social media to packaging design. This is a really simplified model of the creative workflow in brand design because that's my personal background, but the process is gonna look similar for other disciplines of design. Everything begins with the creative brief. Now, unlike the prompt, which the AI just takes at face value, literally without any further question, human creatives have to get into dialogue with a client to really understand what they want, which could be quite different from what they initially say they want. It's not uncommon to get conflicting goals, like we want this to be for everyone, but also premium and aspirational. The secret is asking the right questions. What? who and why. What is the message or product? Who is it for and why should people care? Now's the time to actually lay the groundwork. Understand the intended audience. What do they value? What are the important trends in the industry? Who are the client's competitors? Once those questions have been answered, it's almost time to actually start generating creative concepts. But there's another vital part to research, creating mood or inspiration boards. Typically in creative studios, this is done by sticking things like sketches, reference images, ideas, notes, and diagrams up on the wall or on foam core boards. Alternatively, they might use a digital solution like this video sponsor, Millinote. Millinote is a tool for organizing your creative projects. It's a canvas to collect and organize all of your thoughts and ideas, just like those studio walls. But because it's entirely online, the walls are, well, infinite. With Millinote, you can put together checklists of everything that needs to be done, visualize and gather inspiration, and set a visual direction for a project. It really gives you a bird's eye view of everything that's going on. And when you're ready to share your work, you can invite your colleagues and clients, gather important feedback, and collaborate with them in real time. And starting a project is easy with over a hundred built-in templates available for designers, photographers, filmmakers, and more. I'm currently using Millinote to organize my visual research for upcoming videos on this channel. I really like how when you paste in a link or image, it goes into its own unsorted column. So I can quickly dump all my open tabs into my board and then sort them out later, knowing I'm not going to lose anything in the process. Finally, Millinote is available for free with no time limit. Sign up using the link in the description and start your next creative project. Thank you to Millinote for sponsoring this video. And now let's move on to the next third step in the process, exploration. With a clear brief and research completed, it's time to put pen to paper. There are usually two main phases to design exploration. First, visual brainstorming or going broad. Try to come up with as many new ideas and unique approaches as you can. This should be quick and dirty, just enough to get each idea across and no more. Take a break and return the following day to review and edit. Even if you love a concept, but it doesn't fulfill the brief, throw it out. The second phase is refactoring or going deep. Take the most promising ideas and make as many variants on them as possible. Check out this example for the Nintendo Wii. Experiment and try to approach the same idea from many different angles. Finally, narrow down the field to just three or four options and flesh them out for presentation to the client. Present and explain the creative roots to the client and gather their feedback. Changes are inevitable. Frankensteining two or more different creative roots is common enough. Uh, just try to come up with a sensible solution, then review, revise, and fine tune. Rinse and repeat or revert to an earlier step if needed. There's still work to be done once everyone is satisfied with the concept. It's time to start developing those mock-ups into real designs and writing the brand guidelines. Only after all this work is completed can the brand actually be released and see the light of day.
So that's a really top level idea of what's involved in the design process. Text to image AI doesn't really replace any of these steps on its own and in fact is incapable of performing most of them. But I think there is a place where this could potentially improve the traditional workflow and that's when it comes to exploration. Look, the dirty secret of creative work is that it's work, it's labor, and sometimes it's downright drudgery. It's mentally exhausting to come up with dozens of visually different ideas. The first few might flow fairly easily, but eventually you start to lose steam and then hit a roadblock. Forcing yourself to push past this can actually just bring diminishing returns until you stop walk away and give your subconscious a chance to process the whole thing. But that's not an issue for AI systems. Assuming some major shortcomings can be overcome, I can imagine AI supplementing traditional sketching in a really powerful way. Being able to feed a few example sketches to an AI and have it spit out hundreds of variations would be hugely helpful, even if only 10 or 20% of those were actually promising. Fidelity wouldn't really be that important either, just like with sketching. The idea should be pretty loose to leave room for refinement later on. This could be improved upon by being able to do things like priming the algorithm with mood boards as a kind of art direction. And rather than generating everything at once, using a swipe app-like interface could further hone the results by giving positive and negative feedback. This could work really well for both creative brainstorming as well as refactoring, which can be equally mind-numbing and sometimes feel like brute-forcing a password. None of this will make traditional sketching or comp work totally redundant. Seeing something that the AI produces could spark a different direction to explore by hand. The strength of AI systems could also be used as a first pass on mockups of hundreds of different applications virtually instantly. And this could make a great sense check for designers while developing ideas to see if there were any sticking points along the way. All of this would mean a shift in skills focus for designers, from those who can sketch concepts manually with speed and accuracy, to those who can shepherd the AI to generate quality sketches and curate those results with precision. This shift is going to make a lot of folks uncomfortable. Some of my design teachers at university were from the old guard. In their day, cut and paste meant a literal scalpel and spray adhesive. And they taught us fresh-faced students that we should always begin on paper because going straight to the computer to design was lazy and inferior. I still sketch as part of my process, but mostly on the iPad. I previously brought up the calculator analogy. Does anyone actually believe that mathematicians today are doing less important work because they don't sit and do long division by hand? AI-assisted design is coming, and it will feel weird and unnatural for those of us who are used to the old ways, but another generation will grow up with it being just another tool as mundane as Photoshop or even pencil and paper. This isn't to say that the creative industry won't be disrupted. It will be, but I think only a particular subset of graphic designers will be affected. But let's start with a more broad look. Firstly, this tech will disrupt stock photography and illustration. Finding a stock image to fit a particular scenario is both boring and painful. The best quality images are overused and there is an ocean of low quality crap to sort through. Prompting an AI can be as simple as searching for a stock image, but the AI costs less, fits the scenario better and generates unique images every time. This tech isn't going to kill photography or illustration, but it might just kill the stock image as we know it. Secondly, if your creative brief is, I don't know, show me some cool sh**, I don't really care what it is or what it means, then congratulations, you're in a foot race to the bottom against Usain Bolt. Designers of things like album artwork, music posters, and textile prints, at least initially, are gonna see a lot of synthetic competition. 
As to their staying power, that's a separate question. Lastly, disruptive technology follows a pattern. It always enters from the bottom of the market. The thing is that this has already happened in graphic design. Things like logo generators, drag and drop templates, marketplace platforms, and now design as a subscription service have eaten the bottom end of the business already. This has turned the cheapest end of design into an offshore gig worker economy. The platforms that host the gig workers will probably pivot, but in the long term, AI-powered templates will likely become the dominant form. So what do these have in common? Well, they're all virtually interchangeable visual products. I hate to say it, but they are fungible. One stock photo is as good as any other similar stock photo, regardless of who created it. Likewise, one cool and trippy but meaningless visual, one designer on a platform like Fiverr, you get the idea. So what's the missing factor? When asked what advice he had for young fashion designers, Tim Gunn put it very well. It's easy. You need to have a distinct point of view. There's so much stuff out there. What is going to differentiate your brand, your design? You've got to have a point of view or you have nothing. Where does that point of view come from? Well, your personal history. It's the work that you admire and the work you despise and stories that you believe about yourself and the world. Life experience is what shapes your creative vision. In general, all the machine learning, all the deep learning of AI models so far, it's, it's based on the massive, massive amount of data. And then to me, that is just like they are cheating. Right. They are cheating because they have infinite knowledge compared to humans. They are not really smarter than humans. It's not like they can improvise, but it's, it's just like they, they have seen more. They have seen much more than us. An AI system has no point of view. It is designed to do what is impossible for us humans, to absorb everything, as many data points as possible. But creativity is born from restraints. Working within limitations is what forces us to think of original solutions. The mistake is thinking that because a new technology is faster, cheaper, or more convenient, that it automatically spells the death of the artisan. Synthesizers didn't kill traditional instruments, meal replacement drinks haven't killed the restaurant, and box cake mixes are technologically superior to baking from scratch. But bakers in the wedding cake industry aren't kept awake at night worrying about Betty Crocker. Finally, here are my three predictions about major shifts that will happen in the creative sphere because of this technology. Different media each have their own center of gravity. Photography pulls towards human portraits and landscapes. Watercolor invites themes of natural beauty. Something about the blank text prompt calls out for the outlandish and absurd. The surrealist wave will arrive, saturate our visual culture, and then the novelty will quickly wear off. Something to remember is that these techniques are so new to us in the moment that our perception of how realistic the results are is severely skewed. In 1995, when Toy Story was first released, it was seen as an unprecedented level of realism. Hard to believe that looking back at it now. But once we become used to seeing synthetic images, the tells will become more obvious, even to normal people. Expect a backlash shortly thereafter, especially as stock photos are replaced by synthetic images, and they in turn become associated with low quality content like SEO spam blog posts, chum box clickbait, and becoming the worst thing to happen to Google image search since Pinterest. People are already beginning to talk about the art of prompt engineering, or as I like to think of it, AI whispering, and they're becoming quite protective of their techniques. Sometimes in the Discord community, people don't disclose their prompt, so there is no way for you to reproduce it. It's kind of like source code. Previously, people write source code as, you know, programming language, but now it's really like whoever can build a good prompt can generate very beautiful artwork. I think Han's observation here is quite insightful. Because this technology is still in its infancy, the majority of those who create and use these models are data scientists and developers, people who think in code. 
creative professionals whose industry will be upended by this technology haven't actually taken part in the conversation. And to many of us, translating from a visual idea in our head into code to be translated back into visuals seems like a pointless and frustrating round trip. I want to reference a quote that's so good it's been attributed to many a musician. Writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Now it was said in the context of music criticism, and I think the same applies with text to image, but in the context of creation. Using written language to create visuals is like using photography to write code. The existence of such a system would be a neat toy and make coding accessible to people who did not have that skill set before. But I don't think as many people would make the logical leap from the existence of such a tool to the idea that human coders are irrelevant or somehow obsolete. The prompt will no doubt persist and likely prompt-based art will find its own niche. But as this technology matures and spreads from technical demos and GitHub repositories to commercially available apps, the user interface is gonna become graphical, more intuitive, and more precise. I mean, look at the early Colab notebooks for super resolution compared to tools like Topaz Gigapixel, way more user-friendly and familiar. In 2009, Andy Bayo released Kind of Bloop, an 8-bit tribute to Miles Davis, with this cover artwork. The photographer for the original album cover, Jay Maisel, threatened to sue, and it was settled out of court despite many arguing that this was transformative and fair use. Aditya Ramesh, co-creator of DALI, shared this animation on Twitter of the AI transforming a jacket into the style of Jackson Pollock. Where along this transformation would copyright be infringed? Is this quantifiably different from something like the inspiration Johnny Ive at Apple took from Dieter Rams at Braun? That's all unknown. What is known is that currently one of the most popular phrases in user prompts of these AIs is in the style of famous artist, architect, or designer. You can find publicly available reference lists of hundreds of said artists and their stylistic interpretations. How long before one of the living artists or the estates of the deceased take this to the courts? Profit is a very powerful motive, and the persistence of NFTs and its ecosystem of shameless grifts means that it's not really a matter of if, but when. So those are my thoughts and predictions for now, but of course there's so much more that I'd like to say about the topic, but I have to make videos a reasonable length. Uh, but let me know what I missed down in the comments. Special thanks to Chris Hahn and Stuart for appearing in this video, and of course a huge thank you to my patrons over on Patreon for supporting me in making videos just like this. My name is Linus, thank you for watching, and I hope I'll see you in a future video.